this is Gloria Haswell, and we have um, a uh, sustainable agriculture farm, um, and we go under the name of One Seedling, and you can find us at OneSeedling.com. Um, we're just getting our website going good, so um, it's a little primitive, <laughs> but we will have our manuals up there for free um, here pretty soon. Today we're going to have a short class um, on um, introduction to permaculture, and to give you a little description about uh, what permaculture is. Permaculture is not a toolbox. It is a set of tools. And, and it's a way of thinking and a way of organizing your thoughts and, and a way of organizing your life where you can get into something called permanent culture. And it not only includes plants, and animals, but it includes houses, it includes the land, the care for the land. So it, it's an overall picture. And this is the first course, this is the introduction, um, and, it, and this is part of a required um, set of instruction that you will receive um, whether you continue to, to take permaculture classes is entirely up to you. Um, this class is free. Um, the ones following that, with the exception of one class called Water, will not be free. Um, generally, they charge between nine and twelve hundred bucks for a, a course, but we do it by the the course. Usually, about twenty bucks for a two-hour course, and we try to do it twice a month, um, and that way you can keep up with it. It's a seventy-two-hour course total. If you miss a class, that's fine. You can pick it up the next time because it's just going to be a continuing thing. The, um, the originator of permaculture is Bill Mollison. Bill Mollison is from Australia. And he took a set of principles um, that is um, really known to a lot of people. And with that, he wrote a book, several books in fact, and he, he did this philosophy um, of a, a different way to care for the land. And many of you have heard of forest gardening. Well, this is just one of the very, very small precepts of, uh, of permaculture. And the prime directive is the only ethical decision is to take responsibility for our own existence and that of our children. And we've got to make it now. And, and with today's events, uh, the oil spill, which is not a whole lot we could do about that in permaculture, but that's just a prime example of the things that are going wrong. And um, I think in the coming months we're going to see some serious problems um, emulate from that, um, maybe even worse than they're, they're even thinking, because a lot of our wildlife nesting is in all those marshes and all that, that borderland that stretches all the way from Corpus Christi all the way to um, the other side of Florida. Um, and we're going to see some serious problems from that. What it admits out to is anybody's uh, guess. Um, and permaculture has several different principles. And this is the principle of cooperation. And cooperation and not competition is the very basis of existing life systems and future survival. Now, if you'll think about that, with the, with the exception of, you know, the head of the food chain, you know, being, let's say, a tiger in the bottom of the food chain being a mouse. Um, most animal species cooperate. And even within that, that violent context of what a prime example of that being Africa on their savanna, savanna um, actually animals that are weak are cast out of the herd and the lions eat them. And so it's just, it's just a process. And so if you think about that, um, if we're all cooperating in this thing and not competing, um, then we're going to get to the end of what we're actually looking for, which is to improve not only ourselves, but the ecosystem and, and whatever. Permaculture ethics. Um, it's a, it's a three-part system. Uh, care of the land, care of the people, and sharing the resources. Ethical of, of permaculture, care of the earth. That's provision for all life systems to continue and multiply. And, and again, going back to this oil spill, we, we did a failure there. And I say we because, because we did it. And we all drove up automobiles today. And, and we're 
not quite as guilty, but we're still just as guilty as everybody else in this in this whole system of echo thing. Um, but in, in permaculture, what we are trying to do is build a system where, yes, um, say in a forest garden, the trees are shading the under under uh, brush, and then the underbrush is shading more edible plants, and it goes on and on and on. And if you use a system that has an upward type slope, um, then you're looking at a system of edible things that from basic two inches off the ground to 70, 80 feet high. And then care of the people. Um, if we have a provision for people to access the resources necessary for their existence, but not uh, in excess, that's, that is a system we're looking for. Nature doesn't do things in excess, except that it gets used by some other. In other words, you remember, we do acorns on all these oak trees about, what, over three years, if we're lucky? Maybe every other year. And then some years we get bumper crops. Well, what happens during the bumper crops? Well, we get this huge influx of deer. They're all breeding from, from the years before, and then that year they breed more, and then we get what, the uh, feral pigs, which none of us really like, but boy, they are tasty. <laughs> And um, setting limits to population and consumption. By governing our own needs, we can set resources aside to further the above principle. We are using resources at a phenomenal rate. And you know, back in the 70s when I was reading Mother Earth News, and I, and I was reading all, well, you know, boy, we're at the top of this peak thing, and everything is going to be sliding downhill, and I was going, yeah, right. Well, you know, it's kind of coming true. It's kind of coming true. There, um, we may not be at peak oil yet, but we're not too far off. Has anybody seen um, the uh, little short video clip, uh, Peak Oil Cuba, or Surviving Peak Oil Cuba? Very, very interesting video. Um, I'm not a proponent of Cuba by any means, but I was very, very impressed with what they did when we put an embargo on them. When we put the oil embargo on them, um, Russia tried to take up the slack, and yeah, they, they did a kind of a job, and then Russia collapsed. Well, when Russia collapsed, one thing very, very important happened. All to Cuba ceased. Mm -hmm. So whatever resources they had, and they do have a few oil wells, whatever resources they had, that was it. It was a finite thing. And, and you have to remember, oil you know, powers up our vehicles, oil powers up fertilizer. And, and Cuba was, just like we are, a fertilizer-using country. And suddenly, their agriculture came to a screeching halt. And so they had to be able to do something. And unbelievably, instead of the government saying, okay, this is what we're going to do, the people actually took control of their own destiny and they started community gardens. They, they took over all these lots. They said, we're going to take over this lot and we're going to grow. And it was out of desperation and they didn't know how to grow. They're in the same boat that we are. Our, our generation somehow, and I say our, that's my generation, and I see a couple of others that are of my age group. We dropped the ball somehow. Remember we started out in the 70s, boy, we were going big bang. And suddenly something happened, you know, and we, we lost this gardening thing. Um, I, I don't know what happened. Our, our parents and their parents grew gardens. Um, prime example in San Antonio is, and I wasn't there during this period of time, even though I looked like I was, uh, was that every block had a milk cow. Almost every block had a milk cow. And this cow was passed from house to house to house. They didn't mow the lawns. The cow mowed the lawn. Whoever had the cow <laughs> had the milk. And whatever was excess, they passed it around. And, and a prime example of that, if you'll just think about this a second, you'll, you'll go, oh, yeah, that's right. You see all these older houses. They have this nice, pretty picket fence in front of it, and this gate, a little sidewalk that leads up to the house. And then there's another picket fence around the front of the house. That was to keep the cow out of mama's flowers. If the cow ate mama's flowers, it was not going to be a good time. Steak. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody had a pig in the back corner. Of course, everybody had chickens. And when the Depression came along, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a good thing. No, it wasn't. But there was a lot of people who had houses that didn't lose them that were actually able to grow gardens. Okay, as a basis of permaculture is a beneficial design. It can be added to all other ethical training and skills, has the potential of taking place in all human endeavors. And you'll notice the big loop that we have. Um, this is, it, 
we in permaculture like to loop things around. And this is the particular nitrogen cycle um, showing how nitrogen goes in, in this huge circle. Um, but everything in permaculture needs to link back to the thing that was before it or the thing that's in front of it. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't link back, then we have an 